Okay, so next one, uh, this is Chen Hao will talk to us about thermodynamics, stat mag and stuff like that. Uh, Chen Hao used to be, uh, well, not used to be, he's from the 2021 uh, cohort, I guess, uh, if you call it that way. Uh, so, yes, uh, without further ado, Chen Hao, thank you. Okay, so hi, thanks for uh, having me talk over here. So today, I hope to cover, I uh, hope you learn a thing or two about thermodynamics. Uh, hopefully, there are something new. Um, okay, so the thing about thermodynamics is that it's really hard to build a linear story. Unlike special relativity, the previous talk I gave, which is on YouTube, by the way. Um, unlike that, right, uh, thermodynamics doesn't have, it's like a graph like that, right? It doesn't have a very linear path, you can have a nice stroll through. So as much as I really tried, and other people, have, my friends have tried, but uh, I'm going to have to kind of segment the talk into two parts today, kind of cut along this line. So the first part of the talk will be talking about what is temperature, and start from here, and go here, go here, and go here, right? But then, I want to get to here, which is the canonical ensemble entropy, but without, without, Starting from here, I can't really go here because it requires like like this this thing. So the second part of the talk is roughly starting from here, 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 here. So yeah, so it's my point is uh I tried hard to make it uh, a nice story, but unfortunately it's, it's a bit hard lah. So uh, I really wanted to add more things, but um if there's time today we can try to move to the genre transform, but I hope to at least cover the first three. Wait, can I have a timer? Timer, timer. okay. No, then, Oh, oh your timer, yeah, 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 it's okay. The clock is yeah, so I can roughly pace myself. Yes, yes, I didn't do a full year, so um, okay, sure. So what is temperature? Okay, so let's start with a bit of combinatorics. So suppose hundred coins, right? How many ways are there to have fifty heads and fifty tails? Let's shuffle it up. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, the answer is hundred to fifty. Right. Uh, so it turns out that this kind of counting will, will lead to a definition of temperature, and this is known as microstates and macrostates. So this is actually under the realm of a statistical mechanics. So um, suppose I generalize to n coins. How many how many ways are there to have k heads? Right. The answer is n choose k. So over here, if I ask you to describe the n coins for me, what what you can tell me is. If I ask you to describe the microstate of the n coins, what you'll tell me is every single coin where there's heads or tails. That's what I call microstate. You know every single micro bit of information, right? But if I tell you to summarize it for me, and I tell you to summarize it and tell me the macro state of the coins, what you tell me is how many heads there are, right? So basically, a macro state is like a summary of all the coins. A micro state is knowing each individual coin, right? And the, uh, the question we're gonna ask is, given a certain macro state, how many microstates correspond to it? So in this case, the macrostate is labeled by a single number, k, right? Whereas a microstate is knowing each of the coin. So, uh, if I so how many microstates correspond to the k heads macrostate? The answer is n choose k. Okay, and in thermodynamics, uh, macrostates are things like pressure, volume, temperature, internal energy. Whereas microstate, let's say of an ideal gas, would be knowing each individual atoms, uh, molecules. Velocity and position. So for gases, the microstate is huge, it's huge. 10 to the 23 to the power or whatever. But then macrostate with just a single number, pressure, right? So counting these macrostates, counting microstates for macrostates turns out to be what we're gonna do. Uh. So energy IC model. So the coins example that I raised, right, is actually very similar to the IC model, which is spins in a magnetic field. So uh, it turns out you solve IC model in three dimensions, you can probably win a Nobel Prize. Uh. So 
Okay, so each suppose that the coin right is now analogous, analogous to a spin. Heads means spin up, tails means spin down. So um, if each spin up state has positive energy of one and spin down has energy of zero, then the k heads macro state, right, if the k heads k spin ups, then that will correspond to uh, energy of plus k. Right? So roughly speaking, if I arrange all the, let's say I have n equals to three, three spins or three coins, and so there'll be how many total micro states? Two to the three, right? Which is eight. So the eight micro states over here, and I arrange them by energy level or by macro state. So in this case, the macro state is labeled by k, but in for most purposes of the physics, we actually label the macro states by energy. So that's why I'm trying to make this parallel. Um, and so how many? How many? We ask the question of how many. Uh, Microstates cor correspond to the E equals to 2 microstates, so it's 1, 2, 3, right? Because there's three ways to have two spin ups. So um, I think it's a reasonable axiom to assume that without any co constraint, right, all the microstates have equal probability. So, yeah. So, in other words, if I ask you E equals to 2, suppose I tell you that the system is in microstate E equals to 2, and I ask you what's the probability of you observing that the, the first spin over here is a spin. Up, then you 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 count la. So this one is spin down, this one is spin up, spin up. <coughs> you two or three, right? So that's that's this axiom. I think it's quite reasonable. Um, yeah. So now it comes to the interesting part. What if what happens if we have two systems that can share, can exchange energy? Then how would they distribute energy? So that's not counting microstates. Is how they distribute energy. So the com this is what I call the omega over here is the microstate uh, distribution function or microstate counting function, and the combined microstate distribution, it will be the product of these two, uh, like the combinatorics. So suppose I have the previous model, one, three, three, one, right? These are the microstate distribution. Uh, and then I have a new, I have a new system, one, 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 two. Then the combined microstate distribution will just be the product of this with that, right? So for example, this three over here is three because it's the product of the row and the column. Make sense so far? So, what if I what if I give the total system some amount of energy? Let's say I give the four, then four units of energy. Then the distribution, the the distribution of this four units of energy among the system one and two in the in the ratio of let's say in, in the ratio of uh, three to one, two to two, and one to three, right? The ratio would will follow this diagonal over here, meaning that we're, by constraining the total energy to equal to 4, we're restricting ourselves to this diagonal in this microstate distribution. So if I then ask you, what is the probability that the second system has two units of energy? And you look at this diagonal, and you count the microstates. So you see that it's 3 out of 1 plus 3 plus 6. So the answer is 30% of the time. OK, so far? So um, if you take this picture, the previous picture was it was discrete, right? You see these are discrete numbers, right? But if you kind of consider a very huge system, um, then roughly speaking, the energy becomes like a, the energy spectrum becomes continuous. So the energy microstate becomes a continuous parameter. And if you think of this as a function, a continuous function, we, let's say I want to ask you a question, what's the most uh, statistically likely energy distribution? So you consider this function, right? You see that this function depends on E1. Because E2 is just E total minus E1, right? Where E total is a constant. So if I take the derivative of this function with respect to E1, basically I'm, I'm considering moving along the x-axis, I want to find the maximum, right? So I said that the derivative is equal to zero. You bash it out, you get this condition, right? Derivative of the logarithms. And you see the left hand side over here is a function purely in terms of uh, the first system, the right hand side is a function of purely of the second system. So it turns out that this is this is very related to the definition of temperature, right? And uh, so, okay, previously, this dashing, to me, is unintuitive now. So, I will give you a bit of a better mathematical intuition for what's going on. So, suppose I, let's start simple addition, right? I start some of two functions, A and B, they're functions, and they share some amount C, right? Such as this parameter plus this parameter is always C. Then, I will maximize it. So, what, what do you do? You take the derivative, right? Set the derivative goes to zero, and then you get the result that the derivative must equal. That kind of makes sense, right? Like, this derivative tells me if I increase the amount that uh, A gets, if I, if I increase the x that A gets, right, the parameter that x A gets, versus I increase the parameter that B gets, like, how much will A and B increase accordingly? So, the maximum point, the maximum of this function is when they kind of share it equally, right? 
so that's, this is intuitive, uh, I, I hope. So what if I want to maximize the product of two functions instead? That's what, product is just the exponential of the sum of logarithms, right? And this exponential function, if, so if I want to maximize this g of x, right? Because this exponential function is monotonic, meaning that e to the x is an increasing function. So it suffices to, to maximize the exponent. And that's how we get that. To maximize the product, right, we want to make sure the derivative of logarithms is equal. So I hope that this uh, simplified picture with sim simpler math is an uh, intuitive explanation for why uh, when the two systems, the statistically most likely uh, energy distribution satisfies this condition. Okay? Um, so we want, we will take these two sides and we define temperature as one of KBT as this thing. If I move this KB over, right, people define the microcanonical ensemble entropy to be this. The reason why I label it as micro is because it turns out entropy, the formula for entropy <coughs> is different for microcanonical and canonical, and actually grand canonical. They are, they are different, but I'll talk about entropy later. Uh, okay, so why is it 1 over T? Um, I'll, I'll come to this later when I have a graph, but I kind of, I think it's more of a historical annoyance that it's 1 over T. Like, I feel like um, if, if, you know how like, when people discount electricity, right, they assume that it's positive charge carriers, then they got it wrong, so in the end, we just stick to it. So I kind of feel like that's the same thing about this one of temperature. Lah. Because uh, later we'll talk about negative temperature. It makes a lot more sense if you always talk about inverse temperature. But our intuition is so ingrained in temperature that hot things flow, hot things transfer energy to cold things that both be allowed. Just stick to it. Right. So, okay, so the result over here is that we define temperature. And uh, if two systems can exchange energy such that the total energy remains constrained to be some amount, then uh, the statistically most likely energy distribution will be one that makes the two temperatures equal. Okay, so far? Yeah. So do note that this is statistically most likely. Right? There's always going to be thermal fluctuation. And specifically, I always keep this picture in mind. The 1, 3, 6 over here, 6 is the most likely, right? But that does not mean that the energy distribution is always at this uh, 1 plus 3 distribution, right? Because you see, 3 is half of 6. It's almost, it's quite statistically significant also. So always remember that when two systems share energy, it's never, it's never ever partitioned very nicely. Right? It's always more of a fluctuation, property distribution kind of thing. So this will come in very important later when we see the example of uh, the Boltzmann distribution, we're talking about canonical ensemble. Because uh, if, you, uh, if you think that the most likely thing is going to happen, then you see the Boltzmann distribution, the most likely thing is going to be that. It's the probability of uh, one system has all the energy, right? but that doesn't make sense. So, yeah. Okay, so here's an uh, analogy. If the math was a bit hard, um, uh, how many of you like hard boiled eggs? Raise your hand, please. Yeah, how many of you don't like hard boiled eggs? Raise hand. Don't like. Don't like. Okay, now all the people. Wait, stop, stop. All the people who raise hand, put down, and all the people who don't raise hand, bring up. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Tan, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like hard boiled eggs? Uh, 1 to 10 or minus 10 to 10? Uh, 1 to 10, 1 to 10. What? <laughs> One, uh. One to ten, uh, five, uh, five. Okay, five. And let's see you? Uh, <coughs> six. Six. Okay, so great. You see that you both like hard boys differently, right? So if I give both of you one hard boy egg, assuming you're not selfish, <laughs> how will you share the hard boy egg? <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Tan will be nice and he'll say, Oh, since, uh, what's your name? Jordan. Since Jordan, you like hard boy eggs more than I do, you can have the hard boy eggs, right? So likewise, when two systems share energy, they're kind of doing this negotiation. They're kind of uh, thinking this way. And by negotiation, I, I mean statistically. Lah. Like, they don't have brains to think. So, uh, so, so it's more of statistics. Uh, and specifically, right, suppose I give both of you 100 hard boiled eggs. Right? So if you eat the first hard boiled egg, maybe dream satisfaction is 6. Then second one, maybe it's like 7. Then third one, maybe like 7.5. Right? But by the time you eat the 100 hard boiled egg, the 99 and the 100 hard boiled egg, right, your satisfaction is going to be very, very small, right? Because law of diminishing marginal utility. So likewise, this is actually similar to concave entropy. Uh, so now, if I get both of you one hard boiled egg, the amount that you both share, because you both will have a hard boiled egg versus satisfaction graph, right? And the way you guys both share it would roughly correspond to this. So back to <coughs> statistical physics, uh, if I want to maximize the sum of the entropies, right, maximize the total entropy, 
it turns out uh, I can rewrite it as the maximizing the difference between the first system's entropy and negative uh, second system's entropy. Right? This is because I want to plot them on the same axis and have a nice comparison of the gradients. So I want to maximize this difference, and this difference, these are the two graphs over here. The difference of two graphs is the distance between the two points, right? So I want to maximize the distance between here, and I can slide along, right? As I slide along, it corresponds to how much energy the first system is getting. So, the, so, so this is labeled, the axis is E1. So suppose I'm over here, these two points. If I want to maximize this difference, right, and I can slide along here, what do I do? I take the gradient at this point for the first graph, and the gradient at this point for the second graph. You can see that the gradient here is steeper than the gradient here. That means that if I move to the right, this distance between my two fingers, they're going to increase, right? Because the gradient is here is bigger, right? This guy moves higher than this guy moves. So, uh, yeah, so th this will correspond to saying that system two has a higher temperature than system one. And so the system two will transfer energy to system one, and we move to the right. And likewise, if we, oh, and likewise, if we go all the way over here, system one is hotter than system two, so we move to the left. And this, at this nice point, right, we have reached thermal equilibrium. Um, yeah, more on, but there's actually thermal fluctuation around this point. So at this nice point where we reach thermal equilibrium, the two gradients are the same, right? The two gradients of the entropy energy graph are the equal. So uh, yeah, so they're there. That's, that's why we maximize entropy. But I, I always want to remind you that there's always thermal fluctuation happening. In reality, this doesn't, just because they have the same gradient over here, doesn't mean that the entropy, doesn't mean that energy distribution is always here. In reality, it's more like a bell curve around this point. Um, yeah, so thermal fluctuation, keep that in mind. So, okay, so what, what does this graph, how does it change your intuition? Previously, I, I believe uh, your intuition for term temperature was more like average energy, right? Because you look at this ideal gas formula and then you think, oh, the higher the temperature, right? That means the, the molecules are jiggling faster, that means they have higher kinetic energy. But, uh, but this intuition, Fails because for some, this intuition works great for the ideal gas, but for certain systems like IC model and lasers, right, it, turn, it turns out that negative temperature at a certain state. And if you think of this intuition, you think, oh, negative temperature doesn't mean that, mean that my, I have negative average energy, negative energy, negative mass, right? I can build warp drives and zoom around the universe. But unfortunately, uh, it's your intuition that breaks down. And uh, you need new intuition here. And what I propose is that currently, you have, on one hand, you have energy intuition, and on another hand, you have temperature intuition, right? Now I'm trying to insert this entropy graph in the middle, such that whenever you think of temperature, you think of this tem en entropy energy graph, and you think of the gradients along the curve. So this energy, the gradient is the temperature, right? So I hope that, uh, and, and if you use it, apply this intuition, then you can understand things like negative temperature more easily. So, so yeah, negative temperature, there's nothing stopping you from, there's nothing stopping the microstate distribution from Becoming, from becoming decreasing, right? And in fact, this happens a lot whenever your whenever your system has a bounded energy, right? Like I think model has two states: either spin up, spin down. And the spin up state has a finite energy. Whenever you have a bounded or finite energy, right, uh, you actually get negative temperatures. And this is why it's actually quite intuitive why this is so. Because negative temperatures correspond to decreasing microstate counting function, right? Decreasing microstate. And suppose I have the system that can be spin up, spin down. If I, get, I spam the energy, right? I spam the energy until I saturate all the spin-ups. Every, every spin is spin-up really. If I try to feed it even more energy, it's not going to accept it, right? There's no, there's no states that can populate that high energy with. Uh, and that means that the highest energy state only has one microstate corresponding to it. So you can, you can imagine that um, up, up, up to a certain point, right? Uh, for example, for the icing model, if your, if, if this, this, this follows a binomial distribution. So after you reach half the amount of spins, uh, your, start, your microstate distribution starts going down. And that's why you have negative temperature. So, okay, so what does negative temperature mean? It actually means that the, the system wants to lose energy very badly. So you look at this, this is the microstate distribution. Uh, it actually this is the entropy. Um, so if you look at, let's say I'm at this point, right? If I lose energy, I'm moving to the left, I'm actually increasing entropy. That means that there are more microstates correspond to, corresponding to a losing energy than just keeping the energy. That means that if a system comes along, right, and as long as the system has any positive temperature, I'll definitely want to lose the energy to it because that 
positive temperature means that it wants to take energy, whereas negative uh, temperature means that it wants to lose energy very badly. And if I take the gradient of this graph, I get the inverse temperature. And if I take the inverse, I get the temperature. And you can see that the intuition for temperature is a bit weird, because initially, low temperature means that I want to accept microstates. Oh, no, sorry, I want to accept energy, right? Because the microstate increases a lot. Then as the temperature increases, it means that I'm less and less accepting. Right? Until I reach a maximum point, and that's where infinity temperature is. Right? Gradient is zero, inverse of zero is infinity. So infinity temperature, they don't want to accept microstate and energy. It makes sense, right? Because infinity temperature, you, you're very, very hot. You don't want to take in more energy, right? <laughs> but then the moment you go past that, right? the moment you go past that, uh, your, negative, your temperature becomes negative infinity. And a negative temperature infinity, Ne negative infinity temperature, it actually wants to lose energy. And then as you go more and more, as you go over here, as you approach negative 0 0.1, 0 0.0, negative 0 0.0001, negative 10 to the minus something, right? As, as, as you reach infinitesimal negative temperature, you actually want to lose energy really, really, really badly. Over here, the moment you have any chance, right, you want to lose the energy already, compared to this. So on a scale of wanting to lose energy, uh, starting from don't want to lose, right, you have zero temperature, then you have until infinity temperature, then the next one in line is actually negative infinity temperature, and it goes on to minus 0 0.0001 Kelvin. So this intuition is really weird for temperature. Uh. So that's why I, I kind of uh, hold a controversial opinion that temperature should historically have been defined as inverse temperature, because this graph is nice, right? this graph is continuous and it's beautiful. But look at this graph, <laughs> it's disgusting, right? So, yeah, so, so that's why. Okay, so what, whenever I think of negative temperature, I'll think of hard boiled eggs again, because I really hate hard boiled eggs. So, yeah, and, uh, and likewise, negative system temperatures hate energy. So, so here's a story. Um, my girlfriend, she loves hard boiled eggs, right? She, when, so on the scale of the hard boiled eggs, right, she's a solid 10. Right, whereas for me, <laughs> whereas for me, I really really hate hard boiled eggs. So on the scale from negative ten to ten, I'm a minus ten. Right. So whenever we share breakfast, right, uh, and we have hard boiled egg, I'll say, you can have it. You like it more than me because our total satisfaction will be increased if I pass it to her. And in fact, I hate it so much that I would rather not eat it than eat it. Yeah. So, yeah. So 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 that's my intuition for. Uh, negative temperatures all the time. So, in summary, right, the definition of temperature is as follows: Energy is your hard boiled eggs. Right? Two systems in contact is people sharing hard boiled eggs. Right? How much they like it corresponds to temperature, or roughly speaking, inverse temperature. And I'm a negative temperature system, and my girlfriend is a low temperature system. So, yeah. Okay, so now we have discussed temperature. Uh, we see that temperature is defined in terms of counting microstates. What if we connect a system to a constant temperature bath, then we'll actually get the canonical ensemble and the Boltzmann distribution. So, okay, so suppose I have a very small system and connect it to this huge system. The huge system, um, its graph is going to be, roughly speaking, very, very big uh, visually. And if you zoom into a very part of the, a, a small part of the graph, it's going to look, roughly speaking, constant. Uh, no, not constant. Uh, it's going to look linear, right? And that means that for a huge system, the bath, the temperature of the bath is roughly constant. And if I have constant temperature <coughs> system, then the, the, the equation is as follows. So constant temperature system means that my entropy is linear in the energy, which means that my microstate distribution is <coughs> exponential in energy. And so if I connect a system to a, another big system, a thermal bath with exponential microstate distribution, it turns out that this was exponentially suppress my higher energy states for the first system. So why why is that so? I guess look at it over here. So at this microstate distribution, combined microstate distribution function, if I substitute e omega two inside, right, and you see e two is e total minus e one. So I factorize it out. Then what I get is that this is the microstate distribution function. You see e total this exponential over here is a constant. So if I talk about probabilities. This falls out in the normalization constant. Uh. It's just a constant in front of everything. Then you see that now the new, the new, the new uh, distribution with respect to E1 is this original one, just that it's the original one if it was isolated, just that it's exponentially suppressed by this energy term. 
So that means that if I have a if I have a huge system and I can make it a small system, the small system is going to is the small system's higher energy state is going to be exponentially suppressed. Okay, so if this was a bit confusing, it's okay because um, I have a diagram over here. So suppose that I have a roughly uniform distribution, one two one two, right? Quite a uniform microstate distribution function. And suppose I connect it to a heat bath with this exponential microstate distribution function, right? One two four eight exponential. Um, then what happens is that if I consider a diagonal along here, you can see that because this 8 is huge, right, because of this exponential growth over here, this, this one, the lower energy states here correspond to the higher energy states here, right, because the total energy is the same. So I consider a diagonal, you can see that um, this one, the, the, as I go from top left to bottom right, right, the number of microstates I have corresponding to it gets, gets carried by all these exponential microstate distribution. So, so, higher, so bottom right corresponds to low energies for the first system. So that's the intuition um, uh, I hope is good. So, okay, so here's a misleading intuition. Remember previously I talked a lot about thermal fluctuation. I keep emphasizing that this picture, right, doesn't mean that it's going to be 16 all the time. It is this state all the time. It could be, it's a, it's a distribution of 4, 4 and 16, right? Like 4 over the total, 4 over the total, and 16 over the total. This is where it's very important because if you thought of if you thought of the previous graph, right, uh, as a sort of truth, then a constant temperature system corresponds to linear entropy, and that means that uh, I'll pick up a certain, uh, the first system will be exactly in this energy state, but we know that's very false because the uh, canonical, canonical ensemble, it follows the Boltzmann distribution, right? It follows the e to the minus, e to the minus, uh, uh, e to the minus e over kt. So, that, that's where the intuition might lead us astray. So previously, when I talked about this graph, right, it, it was about how two systems share energy, but always remember that there's thermal fluctuation. And in this case, we see that um, the intuition breaks down if we consider it to be absolute, right, the sharing of energy. So always remember it's a probability distribution. So, so, another, so although that, that's a misleading intuition, there is a, there is a nice uh, way to think about this, probability, this, this energy that a system has, and that is considering average energy. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever you connect a, whenever you connect a system to a thermal bath, the system does not have a well-defined energy, right? The energy of the system has a, it follows a probability distribution, a, the Boltzmann distribution. But we always say, oh, this ideal gas has how many units of internal energy? But what we mean by that is actually average energy. So any given any probability distribution, if we take if if I put you in front of a I, uh, if I put you in front of a gas of gas right, if I put you in front of a container of gas, uh, and I told you to measure the average energy, and I put a million people in front of boxes of gases, and I told them to measure the average energy, the energy the average that they're going to report back is going to be almost it follows uh, the according to central limit theorem it follows the it is it, very close to the average the actual average, so. Whenever we talk about internal energy of an ideal gas, what we actually mean is average <coughs> energy. Okay, so whenever it says, uh, so so basically, systems that are attached to constant temperature bars, they have a well-defined temperature. They don't have, they do not have well-defined energy, but they do have well-defined average energy. Right. So this is the difference between. So this is about a canonical ensemble. Whereas previously we talked about micro canonical, right? That has a because that's isolated. That has a well-defined energy. So, yeah. So Boltzmann distribution. So probability, if A is isolated, if the system A is isolated, then the probability distribution is even, is uniform, right? All the microstates equal probability. But if you connect the if system A to a thermal bath, then the probability it becomes exponentially suppressed for higher energy states. And the probability, the exact formula is this: where the denominator is what we call the uh, the canonical ensemble partition function. And it turns out that this partition function is very useful for um, a lot of calculations you can do because essentially by summing up, it turns out by summing up the probabilities, right, you can actually kind of extract all the macro state properties that you want by taking derivatives and so. So for example, energy, I, I'll do a derivation of this, but the other, the nice quantities you can extract just from the canonical ensemble. So in, in statistical mechanics, if you manage to solve, for the canonical ensemble, you manage to have an exact expression for the, for the partition function, turns out you can, you basically can calculate everything. So here's an example for the derivation. It's basically just moving this derivative inside the summation and some neat manipulation. So okay, so I talked a lot about uh, 
map the mesh. Here's a very quick example for ideal guess. A uh, partition function is the is the sum of the probabilities, right? So this is the this is the energy half mv squared for a single particle. So this z one is a partition function for one gas molecule. Um, yeah, for one gas particle. And if I do this, it turns out it's a Gaussian integral, so you can simplify it to this. You see that this partition function depends on two parameters. One is the volume, one is the temperature. And if you consider n particles, then the partition function is just this to the power of n, because uh, the exponential of sums is just the product of exponentials. So yeah, so you get this formula. And now I have I've an analytic expression for the partition function for n particles. So I can derive everything I want from it. I can derive uh, average energy, makes, matches our result. Entropy matches it also. Pressure matches it. You see, I derived ideal gas law from partition function. Yeah. So in summary, right, uh, we define temperature. And when you connect a system to a thermal bath, your, your probability distribution gets exponentially uh, suppressed for high energy states. Yeah. So. So yeah, so for canonical ensemble, we always say average energy, even though you see U, right, is actually, uh, the, the U over there is actually uh, average energy. Okay, great, so that was temperature. Um, now what is entropy? So we have covered the, this one, combinatorial, like coins, we have covered microstates, many microstates correspond to a single microstate. This one is a fairly reasonable assumption, right, all microstates are equally probable. This one is derived also, and this is, yeah, so now we move on to this part. Uh, where, where okay, so we covered this just now also, but these three boxes are what we're gonna cover now, right? This one, this one, and this one. So here's a look at it, right? Previously we derived the microcanonical ensemble entropy to be this kb kb ln omega. Um, for canonical ensemble, I'll derive this in this next section, but it turns out it's it's actually quite difficult to motivate this because. Over here, we, have to motiv we can motivate it by saying the two systems maximize entropy, but over here, it's is, is, is hard. So I'm, I'm actually going to take a step back, generalize this microcanonical ensemble entropy into this Gibbs entropy formula, and then from here, get this. So uh, here's, here's an here's a, here's a overview. It turns out that given any probability distribution, you can define something called entropy, which is roughly speaking the amount of information you have about that probability distribution. And by substituting different probability distributions, such as if an even uniform probability distribution I substitute inside, I get this. If I substitute the Boltzmann distribution into this formula, I get this. If I substitute the grand canonical distribution into here, in this formula, I get this. So this thing is clearly the, the OG entropy that, that uh, is the most general. So let's try to understand what this means. Um, Okay, so to understand what it means, we need to go to information theory. So entropy is actually about <coughs> information or expected surprise. So I'm going to talk about expected surprise over here. So suppose uh, I have a, co a coin that fires you know, with a probability of P being on hits. So that means that, uh, suppose, yeah, so P is between 0 and 1. So suppose P is equal to 1. So if I flip the coin and it lands on hits, how surprised will you be? Not surprised at all, right? Because probability of that happening was 1, so you're not surprised. What if P was half? You'll be ha ha somewhat surprised because you, you kind of knew there's half a chance that happened. Uh, and if P was very, very, very small, you'll be very surprised if it landed on hits, right? So I want to quantify this amount of surprise. And the quantification I'm going to make is that the surprise of an event happening is the negative of the logarithm of that event, the probability of that event happening. Negative over here is because p is between 0 and 1, so ln of that thing is negative, that's why I have to make it positive. So if I substitute in 1, 0 0.5 and very small into this, I get the following surprise values. And you see that it is, it makes sense, right? This one not surprised, this one somewhat surprised, this one very surprised. And question, why do I define it like that instead of let's say some other quantity that might seem reasonable? Uh, there are actually other definitions of temperature, tem oh, sorry, there are other definitions of entropy that make use of such uh, surprise that functions, but uh, it, this negative logarithm is the most natural in some sense, and there are two explanations for it. Uh, I won't have time to go into it, but it, it's very convincing uh, if, you, if you go read it up. So for, for now, let's just accept it as this, and um, you, yeah, you can read it up if you're interested. So if I give you a quality distribution, you don't know which one's going to happen. What if I, uh, okay, so if I give you a quality distribution, you can calculate 
the expectation value of some quantity as the weighted average, right? But su suppose I give you this Pauli distribution and you don't know which event I is gonna happen. I ask you how how ex what's your expected surprise? How do you what's your average surprise that you're gonna get? And the answer is that it's just a weighted average of this negative log pi surprise value, which is this, right? And that's basically entropy. And this is the entropy formula, it's expected surprise. And uh, it follows our intuition because the more surprised you are at something, the less you know about the thing, right? So higher entropy corresponds to higher expected surprise, right? Corresponds to less information you have about it. And the less information you have about something happening, the more uncertainty you have also. So yeah, so that's entropy. So that's if that definition was a bit uh, not 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 confused, not convincing. Here's an example I took from my favorite Japanese professor Hiroshi Iguri. So suppose I wake up in the morning and I cannot find my key. There's half the probability that it's in my pocket, and uh, the other half probability is spread among sixteen drawers. So each one is one of thirty-two. What's the entropy? What's the amount of uncertainty I have about the location of my of my keys is you plug into the formula is three long two. So question now is where do I check? When you wake up in the morning, where do you first check? If you are this if you are in this situation, where do you check for your keys? You check your pocket, right? Because that's the most likely. But why do we do that? It's actually because checking your pocket maximizes the expected amount of information you gain about the location of the key. In other words, it minimizes your ex your entropy, expected entropy after you've checked it. So let's go into the details. If I check my pocket, if it was my pocket, the entropy is now zero, right? Because now I know exactly where it is. If it wasn't in the pocket, it's among the 16 drawers, this is the entropy. I take the weighted, weighted prob I weight, I weight these entropies with the respective probability. So half a chance of it being in my pocket, half a chance of it not being in my pocket, and I get this. So the expected information I gain is the previous entropy minus the expected new entropy, which is long 2. So that's if I check the pocket. The amount, expected amount of information I gain, if I check my pocket, is long 2. What if I check one of my drawers? Then, I repeat the same procedure, right? Just that this is a bit more not so nice. And then, I get that the expected information I gain from it is this quantity, which is less than long 2. So that is why I check my pocket. Because when you wake up in the morning, you would have done all this in your head. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you have equity. <coughs> You have done all this computation in your head subconsciously, right? And and the expected information you gain from checking your pocket is the highest. That's why you check it. Right? So now I hope you understand your morning thought process a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> so in statistical physics, right, entropy uh, is the amount of information you don't know about the system even after you know it's microstate. So if I told you uh, in a microcanonical ensemble, if I told you the system is an energy microstate E. Right, the entropy of that state would be how much information you still do not know about it, even after you know that it's E, which is this. So you see, the more microstates there are, the more you don't know which microstate it is in. So that's that's the amount of uncertainty you have about the system after you know the microstate. Yeah. So that's for stat mac. Uh, so okay. So this thing called the principle of maximum entropy actually states that the probability distribution that represents the the system would correspond to the maximum entropy uh, limited to some constraints. So okay, this, this, this principle is a bit, a bit hard to it, it's, it's a bit hard to uh, grasp with, but the Wallace, de the Wallace derivation is very convincing uh, in my opinion. So what basically, this basically means is that suppose that I suppose that I have a system, right and the only constraint on this system is that the sum of probabilities is equal to 1. So actually using the method of Lagrange multipliers, if we think of this set of probabilities as a multivariate function, right? This is a so-called vector, and I want to maximize this function of this vector. Then, if I use Lagrange multipliers, the result I get is that the uniform probability distribution maximizes the entropy. So that's how I derive the MCE entropy using information theory. Likewise, the canonical ensemble entropy can be sorry, the canonical ensemble distribution can be derived this way. So it turns out it will follow. You can derive the Boltzmann distribution by using principle of maximum entropy, Lagrange multipliers, and the Lagrange multiplier will be something that's unknown, but you can make use of the first law of thermodynamics to say that, oh, turns out the Lagrange multiplier is actually negative of the inverse temperature. So, uh, but that step is a bit involved, so I won't go into it. So why do we maximize entropy? There's two arguments for it. One is the Jane's, and one is the Wallace. 
in my opinion, Wallis is more convincing, but um, I won't have a lot of time to go into it, but just, it, it, it's, it's quite a nice argument. So to summarize entropy, uh, entropy, it eats any probability distribution you want, and it spits out a single number, and that number represents how much information you have about the system, or how much uncertainty you have about it. And maximizing this entropy with respect to certain constraints on your system, um, in this con constraints on micro canonical will be that sum of probabilities one. Constraints on the canonical ensemble will be that your average energy is some fixed value. Right? Maximizing this entropy with respect to constraints gives you the probabilities. So this is another way to so-called axiomatize uh, statistical mechanics where you can say this is the axiom, I derive everything from it. In my opinion, this is the more convincing way. Yeah, so we have first and second law. Um, so all that we talked about previously wasn't very useful for like Olympiad luck because it's just, you, 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 you don't, it is, you can't really do, it's a good foundation, but you can't do a lot of calculations with it. As in, it, it doesn't involve a lot of calculations. So how about, uh, so I want to talk about differentials in this case because we do a lot, a lot of that. So okay, this is, a, this is a slide with a lot of math. I just want to say that there's a lot of rigorous mathematical backing to all the differentials that you do. So you know your teacher always says that your, you shouldn't move around your, your, D over, your dy over dx, right? You shouldn't move it over like a fraction because it's not rigorous, right? Actually, I'm back to defer. I, I, I think that if you know differentials, it's actually very rigorous. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so a differential of a function, okay, so that's a math. I, I won't go into it, but it's actually quite simple. It's actually just many applications of chain rule. So suppose a multivariate function, f of x and y, that is this, right? And I take a partial derivative. So what partial derivative means is that I'm differentiating with respect to one parameter while keeping the other parameter constant. So in thermodynamics, you always see this bracket subscript y, that means that we're keeping y constant. But in math, you often drop it, like you don't even, you don't mention it. But if I take partial derivative, right, you, can, you basically take partial derivative as x, keeping the other one constant. And if I, if I have a function f of x and y, I can write df. This df means the exterior derivative of f. This is actually called a differential form. Uh, and what happens is that I'll apply the multivariate chain rule. Right? So in thermodynamics, you say, oh, change in f is this times change in x times plus this times change in y. Um, that's, actually quite, that's actually quite rigorous if you talk about uh, the manifolds and stuff. So, but if you don't know that, it's okay. I, I, I survived on just blindly manipulating and doing symbolic pushing in my in my young days. Uh. So, um, yeah. When, when I did my research, right, actually, I, I, I didn't really understand differential forms. But I had to deal with like, differential two forms and stuff. And what I did was basically, I just, I just tried. Like, and it, sometimes I panic because I don't even know what I'm doing. It's like mathematically rigorous or not. So I applied like chain rule two times and like, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> but in the end, it turns out, uh, luckily, it's, it's all okay, like, probably. <laughs> so if I, if I substitute in the partial derivatives inside, I get uh, this. And this is called a differential form. And you see that this differential one form, right, this differential is a linear combination of dx and dy, right? And the coefficients are functions of x and y. So that's basically what a differential form is, right? So one way to produce differential forms, if I tell you to give me a, if, if you pass me a function, one way I can give you back a differential form is I can apply the, this exterior derivative d to it. It's, it's rigorous, right? I can apply this exterior derivative d to it, and I give you back a one form. Another, but there are other one forms that not all one forms can be created this way. Right? So these this one forms are called exact one form, exact differentials. But there are other one forms that can be created in other ways. For example, if I have this x dy, no matter what function f you think of, you cannot give me you cannot give me a function f that such that if I apply d to it, right, I, I get x dy. And this is known as a non-exact, it's not an exact one form. So exact one forms, roughly speaking, they are they are one forms that are obtained by applying a exterior derivative to some function. Okay, so a general one form looks like that. It's a linear combination of dx and dy with some coefficients. Uh, yeah, so how do we know that it's exact? Uh, that's how you can, by using the commutativity of partial derivatives, right? Del, del over del x, del over del y is swap. So it turns out by doing that, you can you take the exterior derivative of this and get that this is a, con, a, sub, a necessary, necessary condition, right? It turns out in R2, this is necessary and sufficient. But in no, more non-trivial topological spaces, right, that have non-trivial Dirac cohomology, this is actually not the case. And that's a very interesting topic that goes into managing monopoles and yeah, a whole lot of other stuff. Um, so what is exact differential? Roughly speaking, it is 
a differential that can be integrated. And when you integrate an exact differential, right, the value of this integral only depends on the endpoints, f of b minus f of a. In other words, the exact differential means that there exists a potential function such you can integrate it out, or in thermodynamics we call this a function of state. So examples will include internal energy, right? It depends on s and b. Gravitational potential, right? When you integrate gravitational potential, the work done, it only depends on two endpoints, right? There's a potential energy function to it, and any other conservative force. Whereas in exact differentials, there are differentials such that when you integrate them, it actually depends on the path c. So if I ask you to calculate this integral, you only need three things. One is a function f. One is a actually you only need two things. You only need a function f of b. You only need the value f of b and f of a, and you can give me the result. But if I give you a inexact differential and I try to integrate it, you need a lot more information. You need the entire path C, right? Infinitely many values along the path. And uh, this will be example of work. Example will be work done by a non-conservative force, right? Uh, and heat also. Heat is inexact differential. So when you see the first law of thermodynamics, you see something like that. And we always use delta Q, right? Sometimes they write you a D with a slash, a, a bar across it. It means the same thing. So this delta means that this Q is an inexact differential. Uh, yeah, so you can see the TDS is an inexact differential. And yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, I won't go too much into the physics. This is more of the mathematical backing behind it. Uh. I just want to talk about inexact differentials. And someone said they wanted to learn about Maxwell relations. It's actually <laughs> just uh, <laughs> it's actually just an uh, application of this condition. So if I say that if I I know that du enthalpy d d enthalpy d free energy d gives free energy, they are all exact differentials, right? Because u h f and g are functions of state. So if I apply this condition to these differentials, I get all the Maxwell relations. So um, it looks like you have to memorize a lot of things, but actually. That's not really the case. So, yeah. So, okay, I'll, let me see. Uh. Oh, I think my time is up. So, you uh, want to another five minutes? I mean, uh, up to you. I don't think I can cover the Jodhry transform in five minutes. So, okay. But I think I can just leave it here. Okay, I actually have a lot more slides. <laughs> <laughs> you can see I have a lot more slides. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just want to show you guys this meme. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so uh, any, I, I guess I'll take questions now. <laughs> questions, questions. <coughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Chen for the very nice uh, uh, yeah, conclusion. Right, uh, okay, so to the right, the right, yes. Oh, wait, did someone ask you a question? To derive the canonical oh. example, to derive the canonical example from Bongo. There was a slide where you said that you take it to be locally linear, right? Oh, uh, yes. But that's not what the math did. The math took it to be linear. Oh, okay, okay. So, right? So, yeah. that's a valid assumption then? Uh, it's way at the start. But it says that the differential is equal to just the division. So, that's a valid assumption to make here? Uh, let me find uh, the full screen. Yeah, uh, the answer is that uh, when you connect, I mean, no system is exactly linear because uh, entropy most of the time for most systems is concave. So you can never really create an ideal uh, constant temperature buff that is, has a linear entropy at all energy scales. But what you usually do is you have a huge system and when you connect it to a small system, the, basically the small system can only accept so much. No, no, no. What I meant is, um, how do I go back? Uh, like 28, you will see there on the side. Can I go uh, uh, Oh! Uh, 38. Okay, yeah, Yeah, this one, this yeah. One. So here you say that the so you say that the thing on the right is the differential of one omega, mm. and you basically just say it's equal to one omega over e no, over e two. Okay. Uh. Okay, I guess over here I made a mathematical oh, okay. idealization. Yeah. It, it, I mean. Yeah. So so what I'm, over here it is an exact it's an exact ideal uh thermal bath. But in general, how you this, this is mathematically this mathematically self contained in that. If I say that the thermal bath has exact temperature T, constant temperature, 
then yes, it's an exponential distribution function. But if I say, if I want to create a thermal buff in real life, it's impossible to create this. So what I need to do is, um, I have a huge system, and then I have a small system attached to it, and the huge system would, won't, won't range across such huge energies that um, the, yeah, because the small system has very little amount of energy compared to the huge system. So the huge system, in terms of energy range, right, if you, if it considers taking all the energy from a small system versus all the energy, giving the small system all the energy, the range is going to look like, it's going to look li linear when you zoom in to the huge entropy graph. Yeah. But if, if that is a bit hard to uh, accept, I can, I, I actually just think of this, this as a self something kind of thing. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. So given the set of arbitrary constraints, what is the process of constructing the, the partition? Ah, okay, great. Uh, sure, sure. Let me let me go into. Yeah. So the the. Okay, so the process roughly looks like oops. Oh oops. Yeah, yes. Okay, so the system the uh, thing okay yeah yeah so this is the this is the derivation that I wanted to show. Uh this is the definition of entropy. You can think of this row i's or pi's as the as some as some multivariate as some vector lah, basically a, a column of numbers and you want to maximize s with respect to these parameters. So there's two conditions. One is the sum of probability one, and the other is that your average energy is some constant u. So to construct Lagrange to construct the process, you have the Lagrange. Uh, I don't know what's the name of the function, but that function is equal to the original function plus Lagrange multiplier of the first constraint, right? Plus the Lagrange multiplier of second constraint. And it's not Lagrangian, but yeah, <laughs> that looks a bit uh, out of place. <laughs> so if you take the okay, this one they write they they write uh they wrote it here as a exterior derivative, but I don't really like this notation because I don't feel it's very precise. What I will do is I'll take this and I'll take the partial derivative with respect to p i s and lambda. But the process that they end up with is uh. Yeah, basically over here they take the partial derivative with respect to p i and the lambda. I don't really, I wouldn't do this derivation myself. Um, I'll do it a bit different, but basically the end result you get is this, right? Uh, so you, you get the Lagrange, you do the reason process where you get the constraining equations and then you substitute it back to, 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 to find out what the constants are. And uh, you get this thing. And this thing is uh, in terms of Lagrange multiplies lambda 1 and lambda 2. But that is not. That's not what we want. That, that, we, we want to find out what's lambda 1 and lambda 2. So, okay, okay, so this is the function you get. The first constraint will tell you that lambda 1 is equal to... The first constraint would, would determine lambda 1. Right? Then the second constraint would determine lambda 2. And when you get this, right, when you get this, this is where you apply the first law of thermodynamics. So lambda 1 we know from the sum of probabilities equal to one constraint. Lambda 2 is the internal energy constraint. But the thing is that we know the lambda 2, we know lambda 2, uh, we know lambda 2 but we, we don't have an exact analytic expression for it because lambda 2 is constrained such that, lambda 2 is constrained such that, uh, like, how does it, we, we, we know that there exists some value of lambda 2 that is fixed but we don't have an analytical expression for it. So in the end we write it as something like that where, where we say that z, yeah, in the name we're writing something like that. And to make the identification with to make the identification with uh okay, ignore this entropy one. <coughs> to make the identification with in temperature, we need to apply du equals to TDS. This PDV I didn't really it is not so important. But to make this identification, if, if we then uh if we then take the du we then take apply the first law to this probability distribution, we'll identify that 
lambda 2 is negative of inverse temperature. So, yeah, that's roughly the procedure. So it's actually you obtain your partition function from like some kind of optimization. Is it uh, fair to think of it? I think we I would say that we obtain the probability distribution from optimization. The partition function just appears as a normalization constant. Yeah. The probability distribution appears from optimization. As in, but once you have the probability distribution, that gives you all the information. Yeah. Right. So, correct. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so the interesting about partition function is that it kind of condenses the information of the probability distribution into a single number, but the number is somehow able to give feedback the information about most of the macro state variables that I want to Sounds Okay, you know, is that I Yes. Any questions? Questions? <laughs> <laughs>